There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perfect deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the anime, but for some they would never cross the bridge to the physical card game. Have these cards been lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Yu-Gi-Oh! monsters being portrayed as actual characters and duelists in the anime is a reoccurring theme that has shown up in basically every series, but this theme seems to be most prevalent in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. From the Shadow Riders, to the Dark World Army, to the Army of the Supreme King, and everything in between, I've always found the concept of monster cards partaking in the very game they're featured in was a really cool idea. Glazing introductions aside, there are seven characters in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX who originally appeared in the game as monster cards, who also all have their own unique cards exclusive to the anime. And with that, we have a fair amount of cards to talk about, so let's blue skidoo right into the world of monsters. Dark Scorpions are one of the oldest archetypes in the game, and to date, the deck has gone without new exclusive support since the late 2003's Pharaonic Guardian, introducing a spell and trap pair that ultimately couldn't help their strategy even back then. That's over 20 years, Big K. What's the deal? Our first character, their leader Don Zalug, faced off against Chaz Princeton in episode 39, sporting two Dark Scorpion support cards that we in the physical TCG have been deprived of. Dark Scorpion Tragedy of Love, a normal spell card which you can only activate if you control a face-up Don Zalug and Dark Scorpion Mine the Thorn. Send one Dark Scorpion Mine the Thorn from your side of your field to the graveyard to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. It is... Mwah, chef's Kiss. Although I wouldn't recommend activating this when you only control Don Zalug and Mine, it is an option which gives this Dark Scorpion support card a nice edge in versatility, unlike the strict requirements imposed on what we have in the physical game. It's pretty much perfect for what this deck wants to accomplish, which is primarily triggering deck out effects by inflicting battle damage. Pair this along with a skill drain to work around any pesky monster interruptions, as well as a Jinzo for backup on any potential battle traps from your opponent, and you can now effectively clear their monsters for easy battle damage and milling. Notice how I referenced older cards like Skill Drain and Jinzo. A GOAT format staple, this most certainly is, or at least would have been, but such a time has passed. Maybe the next card will perform better in the modern competitive landscape. Retreat of the Dark Scorpions is a normal trap card which you can only activate while you control any of the Dark Scorpions and or Don Zalug face up on your side of the field. Return them to their owner's hands. Well, this sounds exactly like the type of support card that Konami would give us in the year of our lord 2024 it should go without saying that i hate it sound the retreat was released in photon shockwave late 2011 ever seen that card in a competitive deck i didn't think so i was genuinely pumped to see what could have potentially become new dark scorpion support for us but after reading these i would rather go another 20 years without new dark scorpion support at least at that point the game will surely be dead and i don't have to hope anymore Needless to say, Don Zalug's anime cards have been a disappointment. Much like the disappointment of Harpy's brother being renamed to Sky Scout, our next dual monster character. Sky Scout had three anime exclusive cards that mainly focused on level discrimination and burn damage as his motif in the anime was that level four and lower monsters are worthless. Yeah, okay pal, tell that to the starters of every modern meta deck. Matter of fact, that's pretty ironic that you're just a level four vanilla beat stick. Maybe Harpies are better without him but let's get into the cards. Glory Level Talisman is a continuous trap card that can be equipped to a level 5 or higher monster when activated. While your opponent controls no monsters with a level higher than the equipped monsters, the equipped monster cannot be targeted by the effects of spell, trap, or effect monster cards. When the equipped monster is selected as an attack target by a monster whose level is lower than the equipped monsters, destroy the attacking monster. I can't even begin to describe how ill-informed these effects are. Obviously, Obviously, this card didn't have the foresight of Xyz and Link monsters, but ignoring that fact, these effects are ass backwards. How often is a low-level monster going to attack into a higher-level monster? 
Trust me, you've got enough fingers on just one hand to count the situations in which that would come up. And with the first effect, it's absolutely the higher levels that you want to be protected from. Your starter cards aren't putting out the Omni Negates and Lockdowns, it's the boss monsters. That's been the case since the beginning. Seems like Sky Scout over here is a lot more worried about the low-level monsters causing a problem, a polar opposite to the superiority complex he boasts in the anime. Level Tax seems to be more in line with Scout's mentality. A continuous spell card whose non-once-per-turn effect activates when a player summons a level 5 or higher monster. That player takes damage equal to its original attack. While I don't dislike the effect, I feel like you're going to be running some serious shenanigans to protect this card on your field because your opponent is by no means going to burn themselves for a big synchro or fusion body. More often than not, you're going to set yourself ablaze summoning through your big monsters, which your opponent will let happen unless there's an Omni Negate that they don't want to deal with, to then blast this off your field before they really even start their own turn. I do like this card overall, and I'm sure that there is some variant of a control deck that focuses on low-level monsters running only Xyz and Links in the extra deck to avoid any self-inflicted burn damage. But Sky Scout's final card doesn't face that same restriction, as all of its potential burn damage is directed at your opponent. Explosion Wing, a normal trap card that inflicts 500 damage to your opponent for each card destroyed by a card effect this turn. It may be the brain rot talking, but play this in Ojamas. I don't know how you do it, but chain this to Ojama Delta Hurricane on your opponent's full board, which includes 5 Ojama tokens, for a whopping 7,000 points of burn damage. Then play Country and finish them off with one of your Ojamas. I will say nothing more. Ojama OTK Tier 0 confirmed, and this is easily my favorite anime card from Sky Scout. It was actually Sky Scout who gave one of the first mention of the Supreme King, who we would then see command an army of duel monsters, including his top five henchmen, the Duelists of Death, encompassing our next two characters. Skull Knight was the first Duelist of Death shown in action during his duel against Axel, wielding a deck centered around the ritual monster Lycanthrope and normal monsters. His two anime exclusives could have convinced me that he was running literally anything but that. The first being Reverse Effector a normal trap card that can only be activated when a face-down defense position monster on the field is targeted by a spell or trap card. Flip the face-down defense position monster to face-up attack position and negate the activation of the spell or trap card. Then send the flipped monster to the graveyard. All right, let's not beat around the bush. The large majority of spell and trap effects that would target a face-down monster are meant to destroy that targeted monster. So activating this card is wholly unnecessary because you're sending the monster to the graveyard anyways. Maybe you use this to prevent your opponent from getting around a flip effect monster, but I'm positive that about 90% of the player base doesn't even know that flip effect monsters exist. If it's your first time, say hello to Maneater Bug. He used to go, dummy. Other than that, you are wasting a card to produce the same results, and seeing that Skull Knight needed to flood his graveyard with normal monsters to power up his Lycanthrope, I mean just let the monster get destroyed, because there's no reason to use this on vanillas unless that targeting effect would banish your face down monster. And that seems even less likely than protecting a flip effect monster. God, what a mess. Maybe his other card is better. Undead Lineage, an equipped spell card that increases the equipped monster's attack by 500 when it attacks, and if the equipped monster would be destroyed by a card effect, you can send this face-up card to the graveyard instead. So many cards that we have covered and will cover in this season make a 7-year-old me very happy, and this is no exception. I would have much rather played this over pretty much any other equipped spell during what would have been a mid-GX format. Nowadays, it just ain't hitting right, and I would unironically run Ballista of Rampart Smashing over this. I'll be generous, though, and say Skull Knight went 50-50 with his anime cards. One of them was fine, pretty subpar, but fine, and the other I'd rather just forget about. With cards like these, I'm not even a tiny bit surprised that the Duelists of Death were losing their duels left and right, really getting washed by our protagonist team. Maybe Guardian Bao and its two exclusives can salvage their notoriety. Yes, I'm calling Bao an it because that is a hermaphrodite, and you can't convince me otherwise. Beginning with Fiend Slime Mold, a level Level 3 Water Fiend Effect Monster with 500 attack and 800 defense. And during your standby phase, if this card is in face-up attack position, you can pay 500 life points to special summon one Fiend Slime Mold from your deck. As a non-once per turn, all you need is a single slime on board during the standby phase to summon two more from the deck. The issue with this card is that there 
isn't really a consistent way to special summon it during your standby phase and make any respectable use of its swarming effect. And trying to protect it for a turn to use on a turn 3 standby phase isn't great either, so you're stuck with turboing it to the graveyard to bring it back during the standby phase of the following turn, be that with a monster effect or recovery trap card, which is nice, but also feels like we're diminishing the potential of our deck's original engine for a potential Link 3. God forbid you draw any of them. As is the case with many cards from GX, it would have served best in a slower format, much like Bao's last card. Gravity Gain, a continuous trap card that requires you to tribute a monster during each of your standby phases, or you have to destroy this card. And while face up on the field, level 4 or lower monsters cannot attack. Double up with a Gravity Bind and you have all monster levels covered in your anti-meta stall deck. Haha, <laughs> I'm not impressed. All things considered, this is actually worse than Gravity Bind. Similar to Glory Level Talisman, especially with attacks, it's not really the lower level monsters that you need to focus on. If this card were negating the effects of those monsters, so stopping any starters in their tracks, then I'd have some nice things to say about this, but that is not the case. I won't even dignify this card by trying to figure out what deck could utilize it. I'll leave that up to the professionals because I can't be bothered. Safe to say that the Duelists of Death have only bored me to death with these cards. These duelists and their cards were mid, and that's being morning talk show levels of generous. Just call me Ellen. Now that we've covered the duelists of death, we can look at a group of duel monsters who appeared prior to the Supreme King's army and served as an early antagonist group in season three. Grab your flashlights, boys, because we're heading into Dark World. Bow before the Mad King of the Dark World. Brawn, the leader of the Dark World army and an integral character to Jaden's culmination of the Supreme King. Brawn's anime exclusive cards are a bit confusing because they have no relation to his signature Dark World deck, minus one actual Dark World card, but are just full on anime plot cards. There are 10 here, so let's get into it. It's time for a lightning round because half of these cards share the exact same effect and we can cover them all at once. The Wicked Runes of Anger, Anguish, Doubt, Hatred, and Sadness all quick play spell cards, sharing the effect that if they are sent to the graveyard, any cards in the graveyard with the same name are banished. In the anime, these five cards were intended to be used to create the super polymerization card by sacrificing the souls of Jaden's friends who fit the emotion best. I'll let you guess who matched with what card. You won't be recreating this feat at any point in the near future of the real world, but I'm reluctant to say that they are bad cards. Every player and their mother runs duplicates, so having cards in the graveyard yard with the same name is a thing that happens pretty consistently and banishing them is usually not a bad idea. Do you need to run three copies of all five amounting to 15 wicked rune cards in your deck? I hope that I don't need to explain why that's a terrible idea, but long story short, no. But you can run one of each, still resulting in five copies of the same card, and I think that's pretty unique. So, Brawn is off to an alright start. Where does super polymerization come into play with these cards, though? Well, I'm glad you asked. Wicked Cannon is a continuous spell card having an effect that when you take battle damage, you can send one Wicked Rune spell card from your hand or deck to the graveyard. Okay, cool, so now we know how these cards are actually getting to the graveyard, yeah, I forgot to mention that you can't really just activate these cards. Oops. You can banish this face-up card you control and all Wicked Rune cards from your graveyard to special summon one fusion material monster from your deck that is listed on a fusion monster in your extra deck that can only be special summoned with super polymerization, and whose level is equal to or less than the number of Wicked Rune spell cards removed times two. Free materials from the deck are always good, Except in the case of Wicked Cannon. Why is that? Because there aren't actually any fusion monsters that can only be summoned with Super Poly. No, Mud Dragon doesn't count. I don't care if it is only ever summoned with Super Poly, it still doesn't qualify. But it's a very simple fix. Just take out the requirement of a fusion monster that needs to be summoned with Super Polymerization and change it to any fusion monster and or add a clause saying that the designated fusion monster has to be summoned with Super Polymerization during the turn that Wicked Cannon is activated. That was easy. But let's look at a monster that would work with cards that do actually exist. Cobal, Excavator of Dark World. A level 2 Dark Fiend effect monster with 300 attack and 500 defense. During the end phase of a turn you took battle damage, you can special summon this card from your hand. That's a non-once-per-turn effect, so having multiples in hand can secure materials for your following turn. 
Unfortunately, it won't be a going second staple with the whole battle damage stipulation, but we're off to a good start. When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, you can send this face-up card to the graveyard to add one Dark World card from your graveyard to your hand, which can include another copy of itself. I feel like it has absolutely nothing to do with the Dark World archetype. There's no discard shenanigans, but this is fantastic generic support that just happens to hold the title of Dark World. It's pretty nice, but now we're back in fully generic territory. Next is Dark Tournament. Cool name. Surely it wasn't wasted on a shitty effect. It's a normal trap card that changes all monsters on the field to face-up attack position. This turn, all face-up attack position monsters must declare an attack, if able. And if monsters battle, they cannot be destroyed by battle. Without fail. Every time an effect comes up that has to do with mass changing of battle positions, or just battle position changing in general, I always have to wonder, who the hell is this for? Subterrors? Crawlers? Ghost tricks? Anyone? So I'm already turned off by the premise of this card, but then everything is forced to attack with not nary a lick of destruction in sight. Again. Who is this for? I need answers. I guess we're maybe guaranteed some battle damage, but there must be an easier way to make that happen. You know, playing better cards comes to mind, but that seems too easy. Moving on. Revenge Soul is a normal trap card that returns one monster card destroyed by battle this turn to the hand. Ugh. If watching paint dry was a card, it would be this. It's fine, but it's boring. Where is the excitement? The wow factor. Revenge is often a concept reserved for the hero of a story, but I'd honestly rather they start their villain arc. But this brings up a larger issue for me. Cards like this make me wonder what the holdup is on bringing some of these anime cards to the physical game. For anime cards that have off the wall, only works in a script, type of effects, I can understand why they haven't been rewritten to be imported to the TCG. Konami works really hard to make their cards. <laughs> yeah, right. Or for cards in the anime that specifically interact with other cards, like the aforementioned rune cards, I could understand the logistical issue of importing six cards all at once and taking up space for new cards. But for something like Revenge Soul, what are we waiting for? It's a card that could be slipped into the next set, and no one would notice because it's so unassuming and non-existent in its power. Oh well. I've ranted long enough. The last card of the Mad King is Darkness Half, a continuous trap card, and when activated, you select one monster you control with the highest attack. Special Summon, two Dark Tokens. Fiend type, Dark, level 3, with 1,000 attack and defense. In attack position to your opponent's side of the field. Have the original attack of the selected monster. When this card is removed from the field, destroy that monster. When that monster is removed from the field, destroy this card. If you're ever struggling to deal battle damage to your opponent because of a massive monster, instead of just coming to terms that your deck is garbage and or scooping, give your opponent two tokens that you can run over for the most insignificant 200 points of damage after having your monsters attack. And make your own monster now susceptible to freaking back row destruction, leaving you in an even worse situation than you were in before destroying the tokens. I am severely 50-50 on anime cards in their entirety because one half of them are pretty good and the other half are so bad that I'm ready to fight whoever came up with the ideas. Since we introduced the Dark World army with the last character that dueled, we'll just go in reverse chronological order of their appearances. So Zur, the Knight of Dark World is next on the chopping block. With six anime exclusive cards, all of which can be loosely grouped into the Power Archetype. Power Annihilator is a level 4 Dark Fiend effect monster with 1800 attack and 100 defense, and if this card battles with a monster that has more attack than this card, it gains 1000 attack during the damage step. If this card battles with a monster that has less attack than this card, it loses 1000 attack during the damage step. This means that any monster with an attack between 0 through 700 and 1900 through 2700 are fair game for Power Annihilator. I suppose the span of attack points could be much slimmer and it could overall be worse. Regardless of what you're attacking, we really only need to focus on the stat manipulation because it ties into the effect of his next monster. That being Power Bombard, a level 4 Dark Fiend effect monster with 1000 attack and 0 defense, whose effect activates if the attack of a Power Annihilator you control changes. Destroy this card and inflict 1800 damage to your opponent. Obviously, the best way to capitalize on maximum damage is attacking a monster with higher attack that is still with 
within our range and at most can be 2700. In the context of GX anime duels, that's a pretty significant chunk, like over half. And in the context of reality, it's okay, but requires a bit more setup and field conditions when compared to a competent burn deck that can put out well more than this amount of damage before ending their main phase one. The effect isn't giving Sigma McDonald's because I am not loving that the effect causes Bombard to destroy itself. I know you can attack with it before using Annihilator, relying on your opponent's monsters matching perfectly with the order in which you need to attack, which leads me to believe that this interaction is in no way consistent. I can't say as though I'm surprised. But I did say that this was an archetype, as charitable as we want to be with that description. And no archetype is complete without their own unique supporting spells and traps. I've got you covered. Explosion Fuse is a continuous trap card that can only be activated when your monster destroys an opponent's monster by battle. Special summon one power bombard from your hand or deck in attack position and equip it with this card. During the standby phase of your next turn, you can destroy the equipped monster and inflict 1000 damage to your opponent. Okay, I can give credit where it's due, because up to this point I was under the impression that double summon was going to be a necessity for the bombard and annihilator combo to really pop off. At least with this, we can turbo out our backup. And at first glance, the second effect seems out of place or even nonsensical because you'd rather use its monster effect to pop itself and inflict 1800 damage instead of a measly 1000. I look at this as more of a plan B in case your power annihilator gets hit with an effect veiler or something. I'm not really sure what situation caused that to happen, but I guess keep this one in your back pocket. One issue, among the many, of our Bombard Annihilator move is that Annihilator can be destroyed if you're not planning out your attacks in relation to its attack adjusting effect. We can sort of address that problem with Power Spirit, a continuous spell card with a life point activation cost of 1000. Now, face up attack position monsters you control cannot be destroyed by battle except with monsters that have at least 1000 or more attack than your monsters damage calculation is applied normally. Why wouldn't it be? I said we're sort of addressing the problem, and I meant it, because this doesn't render your Annihilator impervious to battle, but it can allow you to trigger Power Bombard's effect a tad bit easier because the attack range that Annihilator's effect works on opens up more since we don't have to worry too much about losing it in battle. This is still a terrible card that I would not recommend playing. Second to last is Power Zone, a field spell card that burns the controller of a monster destroyed by battle equal to that monster's original attack. I would definitely run this over Power Spirit because it just adds to the severity of burn damage that our mainline combo can inflict. And once again, going back to the anime duels, you could potentially close out a game with a single attack while controlling this along with Annihilator and Bombard. So this is good for what it is. And just for good measure, we have a fourth card to bring into this mess, and Xur's final anime exclusive, Ring of Fiendish Power, a continuous spell card that makes it so your opponent can only attack the face-up fiend-type monster you control with the highest original attack. If a fiend-type monster you control destroys an opponent's monster by battle, inflict damage to your opponent equal to the defense of that destroyed monster. If you control no face-up fiend-type monsters, destroy this card. Like Power Zone, it's fine for what it is. Another option to tack on additional burn damage and or can replace Power Zone. However, it dies with your fiend monsters if your opponent clears your board before you can start attacking. This is an out of the ordinary example because while this burn combination is serviceable, it really only performs well with an anime duel starting life points of 4000. I would suggest that we add these to speed duels, but we've now missed that opportunity as well. It's the perfect anime archetype, which isn't saying a whole lot. We have one more duelist in the army of the Dark Worlds, and hopefully they can uphold the stature of this group being extremely dangerous in battle. That is Scar, Scout of Dark World, with his two anime exclusive cards. Hurricane Nest is a continuous spell card with a non-once per turn effect that can be activated if your opponent special summons a monster. You can then send one special hurricane from your hand or deck to the graveyard to destroy that monster. Interesting, I haven't seen the card Special Hurricane 
pain in a hot minute. So it's nice that this card gave it some love. So you basically get three uses of this card unless you have the means to return special hurricanes to your hand and or deck, which there are plenty of options to do so. I'm just not 100% certain that that would be the best move. Nest is a watered down version of Hurricane's effect, and I'd rather run Hurricane and hard draw into it because it would be far more relevant in a modern matchup. I guess you could also make use of cards that can copy special Hurricane's effect in the graveyard, but those cards suffer the same flaws as the cards that could recover Hurricane, as in they're not very good. I don't dislike the card at all, but the card it ties in with outclasses it in about every way, other than the fact that Nest can respond during your opponent's turn. Run by preference. The final card of this week actually has some fairly capable modern playability, which I hate to admit because it finds itself in the niche of my least favorite decks of all time. Stall decks on the level of Mystic Mine. Fake Friendship Treaty is a continuous trap card that prevents your opponent from summoning level 4 or lower monsters. No, God! No, God, please, no! Doesn't matter what this card says next, I despise this because some madman out there just heard this card and the wheels are already in motion. All you need is a way to protect this card on the field and your going first stun strategy is locked in, preventing your opponent from using any starters and or really playing their turn. Of course, a card like this surely comes with drawbacks, right? Eh, I'll let you decide that. If a monster you control attacks or your opponent takes effect damage from one of your cards, destroy this card. So don't play this in a burn deck. Got it. Some of you may be pointing a finger at the first drawback. One, that's rude. Two, that is meaningless. It's exactly how the large majority of stun cards function. Go first, prevent your opponent from playing their first turn going second, then blast off. With every fiber of my being, I will dismantle the establishment of Konami board by board if we see this card in the physical game, gnawing at the ankles of children's trading card games. But with that being the final card, you know what that means. It's time for the patent pending purple pineapple grading scale, where I take the total number of cards covered in this week's episode and get a percentage based on the number of cards that I think are worthy of coming to the physical game. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. And a quick note before we get into the final grading, because the Wicked Rune cards are all essentially the same card, I'm counting them as just a single card for not only the total, but their contribution towards a passing grade, if applicable. Of the 22 cards that we've covered this week, the dual monsters get a 55%, with only 12 cards that I feel should come to the physical game. Some of you might think I'm being too strict on my grading because we've yet to see a passing grade. Look, I'm not to blame for the anime having so many awful cards. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below. If you missed the previous episodes, you can check them out in the playlist down right here in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1, where we covered every anime-exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check that out in the playlist right up here. Thanks again as always guys, and we'll see you in the next one.